Book Two, Chapters Twelve and Thirteen of the Blue Lagoon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. The Blue Lagoon by H. De Vere Stackpole. Chapter Twelve, The Vanishing of Emmeline, continued. He dropped the line and turned with a start. There was no one visible. He ran amongst the trees, calling out her name, but only echoes answered. Then he came back to the lagoon edge. He felt sure that what he had heard was only fancy. But it was nearly sunset, and more than time to be off. He pulled in his line, wrapped it up, took his fish-spear, and started. It was just in the middle of the bad place that dread came upon him. What if anything had happened to her? It was dusk here, and never had the weeds seemed so thick, dimness so dismal, the tendrils of the vines so gin-like. Then he lost his way, he who was so sure of his way always. The hunter's instinct had been crossed, and for a time he went hither and thither helpless as a ship without a compass. At last he broke into the real wood, but far to the right of where he ought to have been. He felt like a beast escaped from a trap, and hurried along, led by the sound of the surf. When he reached the clear sward that led down to the lagoon, the sun had just vanished beyond the sea-line. A streak of red cloud floated like the feather of a flamingo in the western sky, close to the sea, and twilight had already filled the world. He could see the house dimly under the shadow of the trees, and he ran towards it, crossing the sward diagonally. Always before, when he had been away, the first thing to greet his eyes on his return had been the figure of Emmeline either at the lagoon edge or the house door, he would find her waiting for him. She was not waiting for him to-night. When he reached the house she was not there, and he paused after searching the place, a prey to the most horrible perplexity, and unable for the moment to think or act. Since the shock of the occurrence on the reef she had been subject at times to occasional attacks of headache and when the pain was more than she could bear, she would go off and hide. Dick would hunt for her amidst the trees, calling out her name and hallooing. A faint halloo would answer when she heard him, and then he would find her under a tree or bush, with her unfortunate head between her hands, a picture of misery. He remembered this now, and started off along the borders of the woods, calling to her, and pausing to listen. No answer came. He searched amidst the trees as far as the little well, waking the echoes with his voice. Then he came back, slowly, peering about him in the deep dusk that now was yielding to the starlight. He sat down before the door of the house, and, looking at him, you might have fancied him in the last stages of exhaustion. Profound grief? and profound exhaustion act on the frame very much in the same way. He sat with his chin resting on his chest, his hands helpless. He could hear her voice, still as he heard it, over at the other side of the island. She had been in danger, and called to him, and he had been calmly fishing, unconscious of it all. This thought maddened him. He sat up, stared around him, and beat the ground with the palms of his hands. Then he sprang to his feet and made for the dinghy. He rode to the reef, the action of a madman, for she could not possibly be there. There was no moon. The starlight both lit and veiled the world, and no sound but the majestic thunder of the waves. As he stood, the night wind blowing on his face, the white foam seething before him, and Canopus burning in the great silence overhead. 
the fact that he stood in the centre of an awful and profound indifference came to his untutored mind with a pang. He returned to the shore. The house was still deserted. A little bowl made from the shell of a coconut stood on the grass near the doorway. He had last seen it in her hands, and he took it up and held it for a moment, pressing it tightly to his breast. Then he threw himself down before the doorway, and lay upon his face, with head resting upon his arms in the attitude of a person who is profoundly asleep. He must have searched through the wood again that night, just as a somnambulist searches, for he found himself towards dawn in the valley before the idol. Then it was daybreak. The world was full of light and colour. He was seated before the house door, worn out and exhausted, when, raising his head, he saw Emmeline's figure coming out from amidst the distant trees on the other side of the sward. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The Newcomer He could not move for a moment. Then he sprang to his feet and ran towards her. She looked pale and dazed, and she held something in her arms, something wrapped up in her scarf. As he pressed her to him, the something in the bundle struggled against his breast, and emitted a squall, just like the squall of a cat. He drew back, and Emmeline, tenderly moving her scarf a bit aside, exposed a wee face. It was brick-red and wrinkled. There were two bright eyes, and a tuft of dark hair over the forehead. Then the eyes closed, the face screwed itself up, and the thing sneezed. Twice. "'Where did you get it?' he asked, absolutely lost in astonishment, as she covered the face again gently with the scarf. I found it in the woods," replied Emmeline. Dumb with amazement, he helped her along to the house, and she sat down, resting her head against the bamboos of the wall. I felt so bad," she explained, and then I went off to sit in the woods, and then I remembered nothing more, and when I woke up it was there. It's a baby," said Dick. I know," said Emmeline. Mrs. James' baby, seen in the long ago, had risen up before their mind's eyes, a messenger from the past to explain what the new thing was. Then she told him things, things that completely shattered the old cabbage-bed theory, supplanting it with a truth far more wonderful, far more poetical, too, to he who can appreciate the marvel and the mystery of life. It has something funny tied on to it," she went on, as if she was referring to a parcel that she had just received. "'Let's look,' said Dick. "'No,' she replied. "'Leave it alone.' She sat rocking the thing gently, seemingly oblivious to the whole world, and quite absorbed in it, as indeed was Dick. A physician would have shuddered, but, perhaps fortunately enough, there was no physician on the island. Only nature, and she put everything to rights in her own time and way. When Dick had sat marvelling long enough, he set to and lit the fire. He had eaten nothing since the day before, and he was nearly as exhausted as the girl. He cooked some breadfruit. There was some cold fish left over from the day before. This, with some bananas, he served up on two broad leaves, making Emmeline eat first. Before they had finished, the creature in the bundle, as though it had smelt the food, began to scream. Emmeline drew the scarf aside. It looked hungry. Its mouth would now be pinched up, and now wide open its eyes opened and closed. The girl touched it on the lips with her finger. 
and it seized upon her fingertip and sucked it. Her eyes filled with tears, and she looked appealingly at Dick, who was on his knees. He took a banana, peeled it, broke off a bit, and handed it to her. She approached it to the baby's mouth. It tried to suck it, failed, blew bubbles at the sun, and squalled. "'Wait a minute,' said Dick. There were some green coconuts he had gathered the day before, close by. He took one, removed the green husk, and opened one of the eyes, making an opening also in the opposite side of the shell. The unfortunate infant sucked ravenously at the nut, filled its stomach with the young coconut juice, vomited violently, and wailed. Emmeline, in despair, clasped it to her naked breast, where from, in a moment, it was hanging like a leech. It knew more about babies than they did. End of chapter 13